weeks of preparation. So I gave Bridget one word from my sermon. I just said surrender, right? So I surrender all was the obvious choice, like we did at the end. But it's fitting how over weeks of preparation, I give her one word surrender. And there is music that we do that fits pieces into the sermon that you just don't even plan on. And then you have Karen, who's praying and brings up sanctification, which is a word I'm like, I got to teach the church about sanctification. So we're talking about that today. And it's all these pieces where the Holy Spirit just brings that unifying word, that unifying connection. So that's an encouraging thing as the body, that it's not just, hey, the, the worship team does their thing, and then some people pray about some stuff, and then Will gets up here and preaches a sermon. There's a connection there that wasn't even intentional, and it just is, is there. That's where you see the Holy Spirit at work, and it's encouraging to see. So we've been working through this, this Lenten journey, right, and we're calling it the new normal, um, and partially we're doing that because, yeah, it's, it's that trigger phrase from the pandemic. Everybody heard, oh, what's the new normal going to be like? What's it going to be? But in reality, as a Christian, as soon as you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are entering into a new normal. You are, you are signing up for that. And that's what we want to get at in this series. That's what we've been getting at, is that following Jesus, being a follower of Jesus Christ, means that your life is going to be radically different. You're signing up for that. If you recall, all the way back to week one of the series, the season of Lent is largely about the denial of self, right? We talked about that a lot, that as you're journeying to the cross, you know, traditionally it's like, hey, give something up. Deny yourself of those worldly pleasures so that you can focus more on Jesus. The whole point of Lent Right, and Fred drilled this home last week, ending his sermon saying, in, when you're thinking of giving things up, think of obstacles. And Fred says, if there are any obstacles in your way that are keeping you from gr- growing closer to God, whatever they may be, give that up. But in giving up the obstacle, give it up to God for Lent. That's what, Jesus, that's what Fred was talking about from Nehemiah, where Nehemiah has to, has to he runs into obstacle after obstacle after obstacle as they're trying to rebuild the temple and he has to give up all of that in prayer to God and he says guide us Lord guide us Lord lead us in the right direction help us do what you're calling us to do give those obstacles up to God we want to push you even further though because we cannot simply deny ourselves but should concurrently strive to become better followers of Jesus if all you're doing is denying yourself of something but not actually taking the time to be better At following Jesus, what's the point of giving that thing up at all? All you're doing is creating empty space in your life and filling it with nothing. It's kind of like how people deal with addiction sometimes. If they try to do it on their own, they don't seek help. They just say, oh, I'm addicted to this thing. I'm just going to quit cold turkey. And Excuse me. Oftentimes, when you quit something cold turkey, what happens is you're not replacing it with a greater thing to seek after, to strive after. So when you quit something, cold turkey, oftentimes you just fall back into it, often harder and worse than before. You have a a huge fallback because you're not giving yourself something better to grasp onto. So if you're giving something up for Lent, but you're not seeking to follow Jesus closer, you're just going to fall back onto that thing you've given up for Lent. And then it's a temporal giving something up. But if you're giving something up that you say, this is holding me back from being a better follower of Jesus, and then replacing it with how is giving that up allowing me to grow closer to Jesus, I'm going to seek that thing. You'll never go back to the old thing. That's the idea. That's what it should be. Right? So when faced with the denial of the flesh, we all too often have these ideas of giving up an object when the cause as to why we attach ourselves to that object in the first place is the real thing we should be denying. So again, replace it with the greater. Following Jesus requires the very denial of self that we've been talking about. But I don't think, and I think we make it seem very easy to follow Jesus. Especially in American culture, where, I mean, you can freely talk about the gospel. You can freely talk about Jesus. Yeah, there's going to be people who hate you. We talk about that. Jesus talks about that. But you are given the freedom to be a Christian in America. So it, it almost creates a pathway that it's easy to be a follower of Christ, and our only enemy 
is the world around us, right? That's that mindset that we have. But I, I think the question is, when we give our lives to Christ, are we truly aware of what it is we're subscribing to? Do we really understand what it is, what the cost is to be giving our lives to Jesus? So I want us to take a look this morning at Luke 14, verses 25 through 35. I'm going to be up on the screen. I encourage you to open up your Bible, swipe in your Bible apps, something to to engage this text this morning, because this is one of those passages that in all honesty is not preached on very much because it says some uncomfortable things. And you guys know at this point that we at New Life do not run away from the uncomfortable text because we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that we may be complete and equipped for every good work. That's also out of the Bible. So let's examine together Luke 14, starting at verse 25. It's really those first three verses that make everyone uncomfortable, but it's good. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. It's harsh words. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So already Jesus is saying, there's actual things here that you have to subscribe to or you can't be my follower. It just won't work. You won't be a follower of Jesus. All right, continuing on. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Or if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees you or sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Again, sometimes Jesus drops these harsh bombs. And it's really important for us to understand why is he saying these things. He's literally talking to people who are literally following him around. And yet at the same time, he says, unless you do these things, unless you are this way, you're not my disciple. We're going to challenge us today. The word is going to challenge us today on are we following Jesus in the way that we're supposed to? Does it actually look that way? And I want to be clear, right? We talk about um, it's, it's, faith, it's, it's uh, salvation by faith, not by works, right? So it's not what you do that makes you justified before God. It's what Jesus has done. But as humans, as people who Christ has died for to bring into the fold— We are given new responsibility, again, a new normal. There's a way of life that we should be living. So that's what Jesus is getting at. If you believe you are saved, but you're acting this way, are you really my disciple? It's a question we need to ask. So going back to verse 26, we're going to break down the three uh, little examples he uses and work through them. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children— Brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So, I don't think Jesus is saying, hey, if you're not goth, you're not allowed to follow me, right? The goth kids in high school were, I hate mom, I hate dad, I hate authority, I hate my own life, my life's terrible, right? It's like, it's not that. This is not what Jesus is talking about. There's something very specific here that we need to understand. So a lot of words get tossed around in culture today. Do you ever hear those words defined? Do you ever take the time to seek out definitions for words? And, because I don't. And herein lies the issue. We often read the Bible, 
And the Bible uses words, and we immediately impress our cultural definitions onto the words we're reading off the pages of Scripture. But remember, when we read Scripture, the first thing we need to ask is, what did this mean to the people back then? What did this mean to the original audience of the text? So in this case, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate all these people, your own life, those different things, but hate, right? And there's, that, there's a trigger word for us. Hate in our culture has a vastly different meaning than it did to the people back then. Hate, like a lot of words today, are thrown around. They're thrown out when people feel attacked or they feel judged and they say, oh, you're just hating. You're a hater. Don't hate. Love. Don't hate, right? This that you hear this all the time, and it's honestly overused, and at this point, it's a word that's kind of devoid of meaning. It just means anything bad. But in Jewish thought, the word hate, or it's, the word with sane in Hebrew, is less about desire to inflict pain or be in conflict or anger or aggression towards someone. It literally just means to love less, to show less priority, to show less favor. So to hate, in the Old Testament, was actually to say, to show less favor to. Just a couple examples. In Genesis 29, 31, right, we have the story of Jacob and Leah. I'm not going to go into the whole story right now. You have Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. Jacob falls in love with Rachel, and then his dad, in a little, little bit of deception, we'll just call it a little bit of deception, tricks Jacob into marrying his other daughter, Leah, who Jacob does not love. And then the dad says, well, just, you know, seven more years and blah, 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 and then you can marry Rachel. So then Jacob finally gets to marry Rachel, but he's still married to Leah. That, we're not going to talk about all this, this stuff. We can talk about that another time. But verse 29, or Ch Genesis 29, 31, can you bring that up, Gail? When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. So again, there's clearly more context to this story that I'm not going to get into right now, but the verse is really important. Because God looks at how, uh, how, how uh, Jacob was treating Rachel versus how Jacob was treating Leah. And there's nothing to suggest that Jacob was being aggressive, spiteful, angry, or aggressive. Did I say aggressive already? I'm saying it twice. Aggressive towards Leah. There's nothing there to suggest that he hated, by the normal cultural definition of today, Leah. But he did show her less favor. So unless you hate your father and mother and your sister and your brother and your family and your, your wife and your kids and all those different things, and even your own life, unless you show less favor to your own life and show more favor to Jesus, are you really a follower of Christ? And we hear about those things, right? There's, the, there's a story in, in, uh, in the New Testament where Jesus is sent, you know, telling some parables and he says, um, you know, if I say follow me and you say, oh, well, I got to go bury my mother got to bury my father. Or, um, you know, I just got married and I can't make it. Like, are you truly following Jesus? If the King of Kings, if the Lord of Lords says, follow me, and you can't because you're holding on to something else. Imagine he showed himself to you. Like when he showed himself to the disciples and he just goes, follow me. And they're literally fishing and they get off their boats and follow him. They leave everything behind. It's not that every person's call as a Christian is to radically drop everything you're doing and become a pastor or become a traveling missionary. The reality is when Jesus says, come, are you willing to let go? That's the question, and that's what he's asking. So here's the point. Being a disciple of Christ means nothing should take a higher seat or higher priority than Jesus in your life. Nothing. And that's all he's saying. He's not saying, go hate your family. There's a commandment that literally says, honor your father and mother. I don't think Jesus would be contradicting that, considering he said, I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish it. So if he says those things, he's not telling you to break the law. He's saying, where are your priorities? Keep that in mind. So moving on to verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. 
So changing away from your priorities a little bit here, that's what Jesus first talked about, what are your priorities. Now he's saying, along with putting yourself second, ask yourself this, do you actually have, or have you actually taken the time to calculate what putting Christ above all else is going to cost you? So the first thing he says is, I can't be second in your life. I need to be first. Now ask yourself, do you know what it means to make me first? Right? Is this all tracking? All right, I know some of you work in construction around here because you've helped me with construction before. So I feel like this illustration actually won't be too lost. Right? You have to make a budget when you're putting together a project. You have to understand what materials are necessary. You need the labor costs. You need to know subcontractors. All the different pieces that fit into completing a project. There's a house a few blocks from where we're living right now that uh, there was all this reconstruction being done. And one day we were on a walk and we saw that the whole front of the house was just unfinished. And there was nothing there. There were no contractors, no trucks, nothing. And we walked down there to see what were, was going on and there was a for sale sign as is and there were all these signs around saying like shut down by the Department of Labor. There was no, the right permits weren't filed. There was all this stuff, right? And we looked at this house and it was literally like faceless on the front. And that taught me a lesson. If I ever need work done on a home, don't use this guy. Right? He didn't go through the proper avenues. He didn't get the right temp per permits, or maybe he ran out of money. He didn't have the right budgeting mindset. So if I need work done, don't use that guy. Right? That's, that's what I learned from that. So Christ is asking you a similar question here. Are you sure that you have everything in order to complete the project? Jesus has tasked us with going into the world and making disciples. He's tasked us with revealing the realities of the kingdom of God. And if you are not properly aware of all that it will cost, you're opening yourself up to appear foolish when you can't keep up. This is what Jesus is getting at. So here's the thing. I can't tell you what it's going to cost each and every one of you to be disciples of Jesus because we all have different things that our hearts latch on to. But that's the charge. We all come to church. We all act like we're Christ followers, but when we gave our lives to Jesus, did we really detach from those things that were holding us back? Did we count the cost of what is it going to look like to actually follow Jesus? Throughout the 1900s, they had all these revival movements, these tent revivals. They had um, and they were all focused on salvation, saving souls, um, all, you know, all, all those crusades, right? And honestly, bringing people into the kingdom of God is a good thing. You want people to accept Jesus. You want people to know the Lord. You want them to come to Christ, right? So, but there was this big push. Evangelism, saving souls, evangelism services, tent revivals, all these kind of things. But there's a problem with this. The good news of the kingdom was being taught, but oftentimes the life change that entering the kingdom required wasn't. In, in essence, hey, here's who Jesus is. Here's how he will change your life. Here's how you have to move away from the old and into the new. But then there was no follow-up discipleship. There was no one to walk with these new believers. So the question was, did they really come to terms and understand what the cost was of following Jesus? Obviously, some were better than others, but it's the mindset of, are we accurately taking the time to evaluate and plan out what it looks like to follow Jesus. And sure, like drug, drug and alcohol and pornography addictions and things like that, those are kind of the obvious changes that need to be made. But what about the stories of church leaders? Church leaders who fall into adultery. Church leaders who have, um, who, who embellish church funds or, or pastors who are extreme narcissists. These people who are spiritual leaders who are not giving up their lives to Christ. Living these double lives of I speak one way, but I live a different way. We're all in need, and we all need to be constantly battling the flesh to make sure the Spirit shines forth so that we don't appear foolish, just like a builder who can't complete his project. Not sure if you know this name. In 2020, Ravi Zacharias, anyone familiar with this guy? So in 2020, Ravi Zacharias, a huge voice in Christian apologetics, huge, shows 
had talk shows with people who were non-believers, would preach the gospel to them, would have conversations with them where he would, he would actually defend the Christian faith and really, I mean, brilliantly and biblically, right? And it came out after his death that he was using the funding from his ministry to, to stay in these extravagant place, homes and having honestly inappropriate massages when he traveled. He's a married guy. He would use the funds from his ministry to do these things, and frankly, that's disgusting and evil. There's no stepping around it. You can't say like, oh, you know, but he was preaching. No, that's evil. That's a double life. A person who followed Jesus in word was carrying a secret life in which all the things Jesus said to leave behind to follow him, namely in this case it was self-satisfaction and promiscuous pleasure, they were hidden from the public, and when they did come out, he was left as a post-mortem fool. That's what he looked like. That's not what we want to be. That's not what we want Jesus to be uh, the figure. We don't want Jesus to be a figure of foolishness. Ask yourself this question. Is the life you are living when no one else is looking a life that would cause someone to think that only a fool would follow Jesus? Serious question. Not the life you put on display when you come to church on Sunday. You're all wonderful people in my eyes, right? But think earnestly, are there things about me? And this isn't to say, oh, you're all terrible, whatever. But it's like, are there things about me that I'm still latching onto that I've had trouble relinquishing that would cause someone, if they found out about those things, to think, why, this guy's a follower of Jesus? Here's the point. Following Christ is an eternal commitment. Either go all in or risk being exposed as a fraud. We don't want that. And I don't think that's the desire of anyone's heart in here, to be a false Christian. So Jesus is saying, do not claim to follow me if you have not first weighed out what, it, what the cost is to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus doesn't call us to be part of the in crowd, right? Just because... There's some churches where Christianity is more exciting and trendy, and there's other ones where it seems like the church is falling apart and dying. Neither of those are the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is to relinquish the self to be a better follower of Jesus. That's it. Walk with Jesus. So the final, the final little tidbit Jesus uses here. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming army against him, with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off, and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Here's that surrender term. That's another term. This is actually a term that's used more in the church than in culture. Right? So it's a term that's used in the church, and it's this kind of trendy Christian word we hear, but it doesn't get defined properly. We hear surrender, and we associate it with giving up something, just like the Lent, right? Surrender something to God. But again, think back to the original hearers of the text. Now, the word surrender is not used here, but the concept of surrender is, surrender is a battle term. Surrender is a, is, is a, is a literal action. It's a verb that happens when one army surrenders to the other army. This is not, it's not like an army said, oh, go send this guy to drop some stuff at the feet of the other army. It is an all-out giving up of everything. You are entirely helpless to win the battle you are fighting. You can't win. You're going to lose. There's going to be mass casualties. What's the point? To surrender is to lay down your weapons raise your white flag, and agree to bow to the more powerful force. So to, to surrender to God is to recognize we are hopeless and helpless and entirely incapable of living this life correctly without him as the ruling force over it. Much more than just saying, oh, there's this thing I don't want. I'm going to, oh, this is making it hard for me to be a Christian. I'm going to put it at Jesus' feet. No. Literally everything, every part of your life is the recognition that if I don't live this according to the way Christ calls me to live, then I'm helpless and incapable. I will not live this life to the fullest if I'm not following Jesus. Surrender is to give it 
all up. And that's the point. The cost of following Jesus is a wholehearted surrender, recognizing he is Lord. Acknowledging that he is more powerful than any interest and in any, any of our own individual hearts or any of our own individual abilities. So Jesus told his disciples to leave whatever it is they were doing and follow him. He says, you can't be my disciple if you ha- put anything else above me in priority. You can't be my disciple. You're not my disciple if you haven't actually weighed the cost and understand what it means to follow me. And you're not my disciple if you haven't actively taken the time to surrender everything to me. You're not, you're, you're, you're well, we'll get to it. You're, you're impure is what he's saying. Right? So Jesus ends this whole thing with verse 34. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is to be thrown away, thrown out. So, real quick, in the Dead Sea, most of the salt, I mean, we get salt, I can go to the store and buy sea salt, whatever that is, right? I can buy pink sea salt and normal sea salt and all these different all these options, but back in ancient Israel, their source of salt came from the Dead Sea. Has anyone ever been to the Dead Sea? Have you swam in the Dead Sea? You didn't go underwater, did you? No, because your eyes would literally fall out of your head, because it's so salty, right? It is a salty, salty sea, but that's where, I mean, it's called the Dead Sea because most things can't live in it. It's so salty, right? So See, that's where they got their salt from, but it had to go under and through a refining process. They didn't just take the salt, evaporate the water out of it, and say, or take the salt water, evaporate the water, and say, here's your salt. It, it, it had different impurities within it, namely carnalite and gypsum, and they needed to be filtered out. And if the salt was not processed correctly, it was literally worthless. It couldn't do anything. It lost its ability to preserve. It lost its ability to flavor things. It just wasn't, it didn't work correctly. Like if they, if it went through the impurity process incorrectly and they took out too much or, or sorry, the refining process. So that's the command of Jesus here. All these things he's talking about, he's talking about being refined, right? So he's not, and this is where grace all comes into it, right? Sometimes when we read these things from Jesus, it almost is it's scary. It's, it's like, wait a minute, I, I have a hard time giving certain things up. I, have, I, I would gladly gravitate to watching a show on, on Netflix than watching some sermon, right? Does that mean I'm not a follower of Jesus? I don't think so. I think what Jesus is getting at is exactly what we, we heard earlier in the prayer time, that the Christian life is a journey, but it's one you need to be willing to walk. And that's really the, the, the key component of all of this is all the things Jesus was talking about showed an unwillingness to let go of anything. Obviously, at the end of the day, the radical change is, I am willing to drop everything if Jesus says come. That's the hope for every Christian, right? That's where we want to be. But that's hard. But if you're unwilling to go through the refining process, then you have to ask the question, was I really transformed by the Holy Spirit in the first place? That's Jesus' command. Let the Holy Spirit do its work in refining you. The gospel is simple, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But when Christ intervenes in your life, everything changes. It's a new normal. There is no going back because you are saved by grace and are now undergoing a process of transformation, that word sanctification. You're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Justification, two good words, right? Justification is when you are saved. It's the moment of salvation. Hey, Jesus is, you know, the, the, I like Ezekiel's way of saying that he'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It's when the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. You're a follower of Christ. When that happens, now your lifelong journey is sanctification, to be more and more like the person of Jesus. And that is being done by the Holy Spirit. So the question is, in this new normal, this new way of life, are you willing to let the old ties, the things that bound you, pass away and let Jesus be your everything, or at least take the journey to get there. Jesus is very clear. If we refuse to let the Holy Spirit remove our sinful impurities, then we are worthless, just like salt. Salt that has to be thrown out, not even good enough to be on manure. It's pretty intense. Our challenge this week, 
And I think if, if you take nothing else away from the sermon today, the challenge is this. Identify those things, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual, that are holding you back from following Jesus right now. Just identify them. You don't have to solve all these problems in a day, but take the time to identify what are some of the things that are holding me back from being a true follower of Jesus. And then, from there, try to make a game plan of how you can release them. These are practical steps now. This is not a, oh, these are the things I need to pray more about that Jesus will just take away from me. Yes, pray about those things and pray that he will take them away. But there are usually ways to help you, as a flesh being, work through a lot of those things. That could be asking a friend. That could be like 1 John says, if you just take your sin and put it in the light and confess it to someone, it doesn't have as much power anymore. It could be that simple. It could be asking your family to help. It could be going and talking to a counselor because you're harboring things. But you need to do something. Be a follower of Jesus. Take that seriously. The new normal for Christians is that as new creations, we are called to give our all to Jesus, and nothing less. We need to be open to that pathway. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you now. Um, I know this wasn't like the most encouraging sermon in the world. One of those things where I think Jesus would drop these truths sometimes when large masses of people were following him, and he would say things that were pretty radical, frankly kind of hard to understand and a little scary. But God, as people who are transformed by your grace, who have our faith in you, help us to see that it is not by our works that we are saved, it's not by our works that we become your disciple, but that we need to allow ourselves to be open, God, to the transformation that you're doing in each of our lives. God, that you are refining us, you are making more, making us more and more like Jesus. And God, the thing that holds us back is our sin. And we read about how in in Romans, Romans 7, Paul is literally fighting with his flesh and his spirit, saying, I hate the things I do, and I don't do the things that I love. And God, that is our, that is kind of the struggle I think a lot of us feel is we want to, that's our prayer to you now, God, that we would be able to allow the spirit to work in us to overcome the flesh when the flesh fights back. So God, we worship you now. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you that it corrects and it guides and it grows us and it challenges us and it makes us feel uncomfortable sometimes. Because you are do- it shows that you are doing a work in us, God, and we thank you for that. So grow us to be more like your son each and every day in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's, that's why we approach the table. One of the many reasons. But one of those is the recognition, like we said, that we are justified by the blood of Jesus. And nothing more. It takes literally nothing more than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for you to have a pathway back to relationship with God. But in giving our lives to Jesus, in turning our lives over to Jesus, in becoming followers of Christ, That's where the transformation journey begins. So we come to the table now weekly as that reminder. Let's reorient ourselves back at the the starting point. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's where we start. So as you take the bread, as you drink the cup, as we go through communion today, let that be the renewal. That's the point where you're now challenged, okay, identify the thing that I can be giving up to Jesus right now. And leave it at the table as you come up.